Hello and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marcus Cole. I'm the Dean of Notre Dame Law School. And I want to welcome you to this conversation between our very own Justice Amy Coney Barrett of the Supreme Court of the United States and Justice Alex Stein of the Supreme Court of Israel on methods of legal interpretation. In addition to their role on the apex courts of their respective court systems, these two interlocutors are among the world's leading scholars on methods of legal interpretation. And we are truly blessed today to have these two intellectuals engage each other and us on this topic. So I'm expecting that law students and faculty alike will gain important insights from this discussion, which will be moderated by our own Professor Bill Kelly. Now, as you've heard me say many times, Notre Dame Law School is a place of free intellectual exchange where we treat each other and our guests with, di with dignity and respect worthy of our Catholic mission. So I'm looking forward to this conversation today, and I welcome your engagement, and I hope that you find the conversation worthwhile. And with that, I would like to ask my colleague and friend, Professor Bill Kelly, to introduce our guests. Education, which is, of course, what we do here, is partly about introducing students to problems of interpretation and training them to be effective in dealing with legal materials in the practice of law. And matters of interpretation also, of course, raise fundamental theoretical problems of jurisprudence. What is law? What is it for? Who makes the law and how? And on and on. And any legal system faces the challenge and necessity of making and implementing law both, which in the real world fundamentally comes down to judges, as a matter of routine, engaging in interpretation of legal materials, from constitutions to statutes to regulations and even more. Theories of interpretation are great, but they must be put into practice. This afternoon, we have the wonderful opportunity to hear from two judges from very different legal systems who will, who will address both the practice of how they go about doing interpretation and the why, the theoretical commitments that underlie what they actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. And here's the kicker that makes our opportunity today even more special. Our guests today are not only distinguished judges, but also former academics who have thought deeply and written widely on the jurisprudential challenges and underpinnings of what they are now called actually to do in the real world. Our first guest is Justice Alex Stein of the Israeli Supreme Court. Justice Stein has served in that court since 2018. Prior to his judicial service, he had a long and distinguished career as a legal academic and as a lawyer, both in Israel and in the United States. From 2016 to 18, he was on the faculty of the Brooklyn Law School and for almost two decades before that on the faculty of the Benjamin Cardozo School of Law. He has been a visiting professor at, among others, Harvard, Yale, and Columbia Law Schools. He has written or edited or co-authored six books on the law of evidence or of torts, his principal academic specialties, as well as dozens, as well as dozens of articles. He earned his undergraduate and graduate law degrees at Hebrew University Jerusalem and his PhD from University College London. Our second guest is Justice Amy Coney Barrett of the Supreme Court of the United States. Justice Barrett is, of course, familiar to many of us in the audience, but I'll nonetheless give a bit of her background. She took her seat on the Supreme Court in late October of 2020 after serving for three years on a judge, as a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. Prior to entering public service, Justice Barrett was a professor on the faculty of this law school, where she taught various public law courses as well as the law of evidence. During her time in the academy, Justice Barrett published widely in leading law reviews, focusing on federal courts, issues, and constitutional and statutory interpretation. She is a graduate of Notre Dame Law School and did her undergraduate work at Rhodes College. 
apart from her professional accomplishments and status, of course, Justice Barrett is principally known in these parts as a beloved and missed colleague and friend. We will hear from both speakers, and they will have an opportunity to comment on each other's um, uh, uh, comments, and then we will open things up for questions. So we can now welcome our guests. Thank you. Justice Stein. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me over. I'm very pleased and I'm very honored to be here in this distinguished law school. This is my first visit, hopefully not the last one. So I'm going to talk briefly about you know, how I see statutory and constitutional interpretation and uh, uh, you know, how it affected Israeli law. Uh, as far as statutory interpretation is concerned, I go by the, the text, but as we will see shortly, this is not something that uh, I believe uh, uh, we can suffice ourselves with. And when it comes to constitutional interpretations, I go even stronger by the text, but yet again, this created a, a couple of unique problems that are quite unique, I think, to the Israeli law because of its incomplete uh, uh, constitution and some holes in the constitutional structure. And so uh, uh, I, I believe that, inter that courts uh, have to apply the law as it is. So the courts should not make up the law. The law is something that courts should apply because it, it, it defines people's rights. And so we cannot redo, we cannot redefine those rights already conferred upon people. And it's also something that has to do with the scope of judicial authority. So judges are not supposed to uh, 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 substitute uh, the legislature, not only for reasons uh, uh, that have to do with, with the separation of powers doctrine, but also for a simple reason, which I call the rule of law, that has to do with the notion of authority. Because the authority has got to be written somewhere, and if it is written, if it says that I have to apply the law, this is what I have to apply. So in Israel, the constitutional part of, uh, 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 of, the, of the, doctrine, the constitutional doctrine that pertains to judges, that's how I should define it, uh, consists of a provision which says that uh, judges are not accountable to anything but to the law. And so I say, okay, if I'm not accountable, but only to the law, then the law has got to have some factual presence above and beyond what I think it should be. And so I believe that this notion of positivism is embedded deeply in the system, and, and, and I go by it. However, uh, for all sorts of reasons, text oftentimes is incomplete. And then there is a question, you know, how do we go about an incomplete text? So for example, Justice Scalia was very, was very, very strict about textual interpretation. As you all know, he even uh, wrote in his book and also in a couple of uh, decisions that uh, courts are not even supposed to uh, consider uh, uh, legislative history and uh, legislative intent to the extent it's unwritten. Uh, and yet the question then uh, 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 arises, okay, ideally he's right. Ideally if the text was full and, and I got all the information I need for my decision from the text, then I don't need to do anything but to decide according to the text, but what if not? And so we need some secondary rules uh, uh, that tell us how to handle the uncertainty issue in legal interpretation. And here, I believe we should do what courts do in the business of evidence. So we should consider all relevant evidence if the text is unclear and try to figure out what the legislature uh, meant to deliver in terms of the message that we have in the law. And so if we have several possibilities, then we should simply try to decide which one of them is more probable than the other. So I call it probabilism, which is a kind of a correction to or addition to textualism or to originalist theories of interpretation generally. 
When it comes to constitution, things get even more complicated. You know, in Israel, as many of you probably know, we underwent, uh, hopefully underwent in the past, uh, this constitutional uh, crisis whereby the court's authority to uh, do judicial review was questioned, and then also the authority of the parliament, of the legislative assembly was questioned as to whether they can uh, uh, continue uh, formulating the Israeli constitution, which they started doing, but uh, you know, it goes very, very slow, and so we have many holes in the constitutional structure, as I mentioned. And as part of that uh, decision, we had a split, and we may talk about it later on during Q&A, uh, among justices, and my position was that we shouldn't even look at the separation of power doctrine. So I fall back once again on the notion of authority, and I ask myself, okay, where is the authority of the legislative assembly to do this or that? And then where is the authority of the court to do this or that? And for that reason, I went all the back to 1948, to the establishment of the state, and then I found some basic documents saying that uh, the legislative assembly is authorized to uh, legislate according to the Declaration of Independence. And then I went to the operative part of the Declaration of Independence, and I said that's the scope of the authority of the legislative assembly. And given this, we need to ask ourselves, and that's a very, very delicate question, because my colleagues, some of them, and we had this disagreement quite open, so I'm happy to talk about it in the open as well, because it ended uh, not in my favor, unfortunately, but, you know, I, I still believe that, you know, the dissent was quite strong, even though I wrote <laughs> <laughs> And so, uh, and so uh, uh, the move was this. The vast majority of the justices, it was a non-bank decision, okay, 15 justices, and so uh, 13 out of 15 have agreed that we do have the power to uh, do judicial review, actually, to uh, review constitutional changes, constitutional amendments made by the Legislative Assembly. Uh, and yet, there is a big difference. The majority decided that because of the Declaration of Independence, as a sort of basic document, setting up the basic constitutional structure of the state, so we have a Jewish democratic state, and from this they said we are free to deduce principles of judicial review, because if it's Jewish and democratic, then by definition, we have the power to do judicial review to undo anything that is un-Jewish or undemocratic. And I said, well, well this second move first is, is like what we call petitio principa in Latin. That's, that's, you know, you presuppose what you want to prove. This cannot be. Even in Marbury versus Madison, Justice Marshall went on very, very delicately when he asked whether or not there is a power to do judicial review given a fully determined constitution. I said, no, judicial review is a second question that needs to be asked separately. And so we need to look now into our authority to review. And then I said that our authority is limited. Why limited? Because the Declaration of Independence, in fact, determined the scope of what the Legislative Assembly can do. And whatever Legislative Assembly does above and beyond any plausible meaning of what's in there, it is then and only then that we can do judicial review pursuant to a statute that does have this sort of provision. And so, uh, my colleagues thought that I'm being unduly formalistic, textually, so we will probably see there is a big difference between the two cultures, okay? <laughs> so, in the United States, I assume, uh, if uh, we have, uh, if we had, or if you had, justices who espouse uh, leading constitutionalism, Okay, well, some people might say, well, this is too much, this is going over the top, regardless of what political persuasion you adopt. Now, in Israel, in this decision, we had 14 against one, so 14 justices in favor of leading constitutionalism, and that was taken for granted. Even the two dissenters who said that the Legislative Assembly is authorized to legislate anything in terms of constitutional changes, and the Supreme Court has no powers. They grounded that decision on living constitutionalism that emphasized the notion of uh, majoritarianism uh, and uh, popular will, nothing that was written in any of the founding documents. A and the same uh, was true about the majority of the justices. And then in my case, I found myself the only one who actually looked into this, and then it was interesting to see that later on the popular newspaper, uh, my position was described as creative.
<laughs> so, <laughs> and that's the story. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know if I'm as creative as Justice Stein, so we'll see. Um, it's really great to be home. Um, I always love coming back to campus, and so I'm grateful for Professor Tor for putting this event together. Um, so I think one of the values, I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity to have a comparative discussion with Justice Stein, because I think one of the wonderful and, um, especially for law students, really instructive things about comparative law is that you can see that nothing about our system is inevitable. So Justice Stein just said that there's widespread, you said unanimous agreement, right, in living constitutionalism. And that stems from the nature of the Israeli constitution and the nature of the Israeli system. So there's nothing inherently, you know, I, I would consider myself an originalist in constitutional interpretation. But in my view, that stems from the nature of the American constitution and its status as a written document um, that goes through the supermajoritarian process. So it's not that in the abstract we might say that either living constitutionalism or originalism is the best way to do it or is inevitable or that the Israeli Supreme Court has an illegitimate approach to judicial review because it adopts living constitutionalism. It's just that that's the nature of how they have structured their law. And in my view, that's distinct from the way that we in the United States have structured our law. Justice Stein referred to Marbury versus Madison, and as those of you who have taken con law know, the, the one else may not have gotten quite this far yet, but Marbury versus Madison, uh, Chief Justice Marshall stressed the written nature of the document, and that our document stands above as a supreme law that anything that's in conflict with it must bend. And that's distinct. I mean, the fact that we are grounded um, in a written constitution Whereas, as I understand it, and maybe Justice Stein can clarify this, you know, if I'm wrong, you know, as, as we discuss after this, you know, the Israeli constitution or the Israeli system of basic law doesn't have one document that you can point to in the same way and say, this is it. In fact, Justice Stein was telling me at breakfast this morning, there's not even a, a definite agreed upon means of amendment, right? Yeah. So in our system, you know, where we have Article 5 prescribing a quite onerous mechanism for amendment, you know, it's, it's much harder, I think, to make the case for living constitutionalism because the Constitution itself is written, prescribed, and prescribes the means for its own amendment. Um, but I think that Justice Stein and I have a lot of common ground in our emphasis upon the text because when there is text that embodies the law, the text, of course, counts. And it is also true, as Justice Stein says, that the text can't answer every question. So as I see it, um, and I'll focus on statutory interpretation here, as, as I see it, statutory interpretation problems tend to come in two varieties. One is when the text is clear, but it seems to lead to a result that feels uncomfortable or maybe like it doesn't make much sense. I'm not going to go so far as to say absurd, although you know there is you know this absurdity doctrine in statutory interpretation. And then the question is, does the judge go with the text? Or does the judge go with either what makes the most sense, might be one way of looking at it, like Justice Breyer would advocate that way, or another way would be to say, does the judge do what he thinks Congress would have wanted him or her to do? And the textualist would say, no, it's the text that survived bicameralism and presentment. It represents what the democratic process yielded, and so the text controls. So one famous example of this in the case Holy Trinity, you know, the statute prescribed the importation of um, foreigners to do labor or service of any kind. The question is whether that applied to the hiring of a, an English minister. And the court said, oh, no, 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 surely Congress couldn't have had in mind men of the cloth. Like, this was just about blue-collar workers. It would be absurd, even though the text of the statute seems to encompass that, that, that uh, situation pretty clearly. So I think there's fairly wide agreement on the current Supreme Court that it would be very surprising to see in a modern opinion, as uh, while it was not unusual in opinions before textualism came to prominence in the 80s, to say, well, the text says this, but we think it would make more sense to do that. Really, I, I can't think of any of the nine justices who would write that in an opinion now. But that was once a much more common mode of statutory interpretation. I think the other interpretive problem, which is much harder, is when the text is a little bit more open-ended or it doesn't 
expressly rule something out. So some people might say, oh, when the text runs out, or some people might say when the text seems ambiguous, when provisions seem to clash, or you know, what about when the language of a statute, if taken literally, might permit you know, whatever the executive branch is saying it has the authority to do, but it doesn't actually seem when you take that language in context that it can be read as broadly as the executive um, might be uh, interpreting it to. So I think that's where there's more disagreement these days. It's about how do you handle determining what the breadth of language is in context? Um, how do you resolve problems of provisions that seem to be in tension? And then I think the substantive canons of interpretation that we apply, I'm not sure if the Israeli Supreme Court does something similar, but we apply substantive canons of interpretation, which I'm sure many of you have come across, like the avoidance doctrine, which instructs a court to interpret a statute so as to avoid provoking a serious constitutional question or federalism doctrines, which are designed to interpret statutes in ways, ways that preserve the sovereignty of a state. Um, those are atextual. Um, it's not really clear where they come from. And they would push the language of a statute away from what a textualist would normally adhere to, which would be its meaning to an ordinary user of the language. So I think substantive canons and their role in statutory interpretation have taken on more prominence as the court has moved away from what you might consider a more loosey-goosey, kind of do what makes sense, do what the legislature might intend approach. One thing I will flag for you, know, you students who are interested in criminal law is that one debate about substantive canons on the court right now is about the rule of lenity. There are competing approaches on the court, and I would say you can see in the opinions of Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh They've written more um, expressly about their differing views of the rule of lenity, about how much oomph the rule of lenity has. How much can it actually really steer you away from the most natural interpretation of a statute in favor of one that favors the accused? So I would say you know, that's where statutory interpretation is. And I will say that I think that my view of statutory interpretation, as I said at the outset, really grows from my understanding of the role of the judiciary and our system of separated power. Um, and because we, unlike Israel, don't have a parliamentary system, you know, we have three separate branches of government, and the president and Congress are not always controlled by the same party. They are distinct, you know, as distinct from a parliamentary system. Um, and so that creates more tension. There are more clashes between the executive branch and perhaps Congress, where they may not be acting in unison. Um, and, you know, it, it puts the court in the position of refereeing between Congress and the executive branch in ways that would be different from a parliamentary system. Um, on constitutional interpretation, I'll just add a few words. I said at the beginning that Marbury and Chief Justice Marshall's approach to the constitution as a written document, I think that also the role of the court in judicial review also stems from its role in our system of separated powers. Um, I think constitutional interpretation differs from statutory interpretation in many ways. I mean, fundamentally, the exercise is still the same. The words count, and an originalist in constitutional interpretation, like a textualist in statutory interpretation, would interpret those words as they would be understood by a reasonable user of language at the time. But the Constitution tends to be older than most statutes with which the court deals. So, you know, if you're dealing with um, immigration statutes or, you know, RICO or, you know, criminal statutes that were passed within the last 50 years, that has a much different um, uh, valence than interpreting a document, you know, that was uh, the original Constitution ratified um, in the late 18th century. So, um, I think the meaning can be more distant. Um, and I think that the Constitution is more open-ended. And I don't take that open-endedness. A lot of people are fond from quoting the language in Marbury versus Madison. It is a Constitution we are expounding as a justification for living constitutionalism. I don't take that language that way, but I think it recognizes the reality that the Constitution is a pretty bare-bones document, and so it uses more open-ended language that leaves more room. I mean, the whole point of the document, right, is to create ground rules, and then to leave most of the working out of our policy issues to the legislature. So the Constitution leaves a lot of things open, and if it didn't, frankly, I don't think it would have lasted as long. If the Constitution was as long as the constitutions of some countries, which can be quite thick, 
and it tried to address every single issue, you know, lacking the foresight, you know, that, that one might have about what technological changes or other changes are to come, um, I think those constitutions um, don't last, which is why, you know, we have, I think, the, the, which is, I think, the reason why we have been able to have the oldest written constitution in the world. We were the first country to have a written constitution, with like one little caveat that I don't think really matters. Um, <laughs> and um, we have the oldest. So um, I think I will end right there. And I don't know if Justice Stein or Professor Kelly. Well, if either of you, well, Professor Stein, if you have anything to comment on Justice Barrett's remarks, we'll begin with that. And if not, I have a question that, or something. That's it. Even though our constitution is sort of underdeveloped, you know, the constitutional story is pretty bizarre. So what happened back in 1948, 14th of May, there's this document, Declaration of Independence, saying that uh, the state of Israel is established in accordance with uh, the decision of the United Nations. And then the constitution is going to be prepared by the uh, legislative assembly no later than October 1. So this is one of the promises that you never intend to fulfill. And so as a consequence, so we have, we have, we are having those problems. At the same time, I think we do have a little sort of relative advantage because our uh, uh, record is pretty, I mean, in terms of founding documents, in terms of what they meant, in terms of letters and you know discussions surrounding the formulation of those documents, the record is really, really good and it goes back only 75 years. And so we do have this relative advantage in terms of access, which means if you want to be an originalist, you can be a pretty decent originalist. The, the question is whether you want to be one. That's, that's the question in Israel now, yes. Well, thank you both. Uh, it's extremely interesting um, to, to listen to both of you. Um, I want to begin by um, just raising a basic question for Justice Stein. In, in United States constitutional theory, as I'm sure you know, uh, the debates have always um, revolved around a, a sentence, in recent decades, re revolved around a sentence uh, and an insight description in a famous book by Alexander Bickel, where he says, the root difficulty is that judicial review is a counter-majoritarian institution. And so we worry about judicial review a lot because it puts nine judges, a majority of which is five, of whom is five, in the position of saying to the product of the majoritarian legislative governance process, you can't do that in the name of the Constitution. Um, and from the standpoint of an outsider observing Israel, it seems very strange for the arguments in your recent um, controversies to be that the, the anti-democratic position is the one where parliament or the, 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 the legislative body has control and the protection of democracy is at, the, is at, is at least thought to be um, the part of the unelected Supreme Court justices. Yeah. So what gives? <laughs> okay. I, well, uh, uh, again, I approach this whole issue, uh, uh, first of all, from the point of view of authority. So I believe that unlike natural people who are born uh, totally free, and so unless, you, uh, so unless and until you impose upon them duties and obligations, they, they don't have those obligations. But authorities, including the Supreme Court and other courts, the judiciary, and all the branches of government, as far as I'm concerned, they do not exist outside the scope of their formal authority. And for that reason, I look at the definition of what courts are authorized and not authorized to do, and the same also for the Legislative Assembly. And so the Legislative Assembly in Israel cannot do as it pleases. That's for sure, because uh, I asked this question during the hearing. People who argued this uh, argument from democracy, the counter-majoritarian difficulty, and they said, look, uh, that's counter-majoritarian difficulty. You're not going to resolve. You go the way the majority eventually uh, went in that case. But then I asked the, the attorney for the government, so what, give me, what's the authority for the proposition that the legislative assembly can legislate anything, can do any constitutional amendment as it pleases? So, for example, if it makes a constitutional amendment saying that you know, you're going to kick you out of your home, there's no compensation being paid, and now you and your family become, you know, uh, homeless. 
can that happen? Or can you make a, a law saying that females are not also are not uh, will never be appointed as ambassadors or will never uh, uh, hold any governmental position with females? You can you cannot do this either, apparently. But then, in order to answer this question, for me, common sense is not enough. So you need to you need to identify this source of power, and the, and, and the government attorney was not able to identify this source of power for a simple reason because it doesn't exist. And so unlike the United Kingdom where parliament was granted full authority to uh, legislate anything uh, it pleases, you know, when the deal was struck between the monarchy and the parliament. And so monarchy technically be became part of this whole system. Uh, in Israel, uh, the legislative assembly was given the authority to legislate and to formulate constitution subject to the declaration of independence that imposed restrictions. The demand for equality, for example, it says full and complete equality. And then there are certain other guaranteed rights. And so this is something that uh, the legislative assembly cannot overstep. And so I wrote, even in, you know, even if you vote 120, you have 120 members of, of the legislative assembly to nil, you cannot do it because you don't have this authority. So when this authority doesn't, cannot come from nothing, okay? And so, uh, there is nothing in natural law even that dictates uh, the notion of majoritarianism. There is even an article actually published in one of the publications of this law school in the 50s, Natural Law Forum, now I recall, saying that, that natural law also calls for limitations. It's by Richard Calhoun, I think. Yes, calls for, lim for, for limitations upon the majoritarian will. That's in, but you know, I'm, I'm not going that far as to invoke natural law, but. Uh, 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 there must be some formal authority. On the other hand, speaking of what you just mentioned, Bickel, I, I believe that uh, at some point, if uh, the judiciary uh, takes the liberty of interpreting open-ended concepts, or as I call them, essentially contested concepts that we have in, in the constitutional, in our constitutional documents, like equality, like freedom, justice, and stuff like this, as it pleases, then uh, you know what Bickel called the least dangerous branch will eventually become the most dangerous branch, and I don't want to become the most dangerous branch. And for that reason, uh, my view is that those documents they set up a framework within which the government, as well as the legislative assembly, can operate as it pleases, so long as it doesn't overstep the authority vested uh, uh, upon them in those originating documents. And, and how do I know whether they did or not? I say, well, I take the public original meaning of what those documents say. And if there is, no, there is not a single plausible notion of equality, for example, that aligns with what the Legislative Assembly did, then I will not hesitate saying it's unconstitutional, which I actually did in the previous decision in validating uh, a personal law. So we do have a prohibition on the constitutional prohibition on personal legislation. There was a law made specifically to benefit the, some specific guys. So well, that's, this cannot go. Chris. Well, I think, can I just say Chris. something? And I think, again, Justice Stein and I probably agree on this because I think Bickle's identification of the counter-majoritarian difficulty reflects unease with this idea that five justices, if it were a bare majority of our court, would be imposing law on people. However, if the Constitution plainly rules something out, like if Congress enacts a law that violates free speech rights, the, the whole idea is that Congress has acted beyond its authority and that it actually is honoring the supermajoritarian will of the American people in our foundational document to say that Congress has overstepped. To my mind, the real um, risk that I keep in mind of the constitutional, of the counter-majoritarian difficulty now is that if you enforce prohibitions that actually do not exist in the Constitution, that go beyond the Constitution's text in a way that living constitutionalism would invite, then you are clipping the ability of Congress to legislate or state legislatures to legislate without the authority to do so. Then the court itself would be overstepping the authority vested in it. So that, I mean, it, it, it depends on what the law is. The, the soundness, legitimacy of the decision of either court depends on what the law is. And so we have a written constitution that is more or less uh, clear in its text, more or less liquidated in precedent. Israel, as I understand, the, the standard 
it, it, it comes down to um, is it's got to be a Jewish state that's de democratic. And your court has the power to decide what is anti-democratic. What is the rule of decision? Where does that come from? And how are you supposed to reason about that? Well, that echoes my criticism of the, of, of the majority. So, they, so I, I will try to, you know, to do my best to defend the view I don't quite agree with. Uh, uh, so the, <laughs> the uh, majority said, look, I take, so for my part, I took the Declaration of Independence that has some enumerated rights, including equality, including justice, basically access to courts, including uh, the right uh, of Jews to immigrate uh, to Israel, including uh, equality prohibits all sorts of discrimination, most certainly religious discrimination. Then there are also certain guarantees of preservation of religious life of all the three religions in Israel. That's also in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, whereas, and I say, okay, I need to look into any of those notions whenever we have this conflict. And we do have the constitutional avoidance doctrine. In fact, our court explicitly relied on Atlantis. Oh, really? Yeah, when, it, when, when, when it decided, that was long before I was appointed. Yeah, that was in the founding decision. The, the Israeli Marbury versus Madison, they did refer to Ashland and said, yes, we do constitutional avoidance. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and so we need to look into those notions and see what they say. And then see whether what the Legislative Assembly did amounted to overstepping the authority, meaning doing something that no plausible meaning can judge you know, of, of what it has, of the specific, uh, still abstract, and yet enumerated uh, uh, rights and rules in the Declaration of Independence. So we need to look into whether uh, uh, what they did oversteps any plausible understanding, any plausible interpretation of those rules as made back then in, in uh, 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 May 1948. And then, yes, then I will step in and interfere, and I will say, well, that's unconstitutional. The majority, they said something totally different. They say, we take the document, the same document that I took, and we reduce it to its common denominator. That's the move number one. The common denominator is Jewish and democratic. This is the big emphasis on democratic. Democratic comes in capital letters. Uh, and then, from this, this common denominator is something that the Legislative Assembly cannot overstep, and we are going to decide what it means. And I said, this is something that logically is not dictated, and substantively I don't agree with, but that's the, but that's the way it is. Why it happened? It happened because of the haphazard uh, constitutional negotiations that took place in Israel. Sadly, you know, Israel is a place that, as we all know, you know is yet to end all those hostilities and wars. And because of this, law was kind of put, you know, as something that's not very important, uh, especially back in 1948. They said, okay, we'll do it later. Even in other areas of the law, in order, instead of legislating, they made a provision saying that we are going to continue the common law of England that used to be the law of the land before the establishment of the state of Israel, subject to some modifications that gradually took place, because again, law is not something that is very important. Well, what is more important is that people have enough food, enough security, and that we kind of, you know, that we stand against enemies. And uh, we stand uh, our right as a Jewish state to exist. That, that's important. And for that reason, the law has become incomplete, in particular constitutional law. Private law develops really nice criminal law as well. But constitutional law somehow, also because the disagreement, so nobody wanted to touch it. And then the Supreme Court filled in this void given also the situation that uh, 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 you did mention, that Israel doesn't have uh, a system, the same system of checks and balances. And this was also actually emphasized by the majority. The majority judges said, well, we are not the United States. The United States has this system of checks and balances. It's president, there is president of the United States, then there is Congress, and then there is House of uh, uh, Representatives, Whereas in Israel, we have government that controls the parliament. And for that reason, the majoritarian power is excessive. And we are here to balance it. 
current state, we need to appropriate this broad notion of Jewish and democratic to retain the power of judicial review, which again, uh, I think goes above and beyond what courts so matters that we, we uh, are supposed to do, but I definitely understand this position. One more point I uh, about to raise with uh, for, for Justice Merritt. What do you think about this idea of probabil probabilism? probabilism? Um, in interpretation. Uh, yeah. In interpretation. I mean, it is a perennial problem in statutory interpretation. What if the law is written at too high a level of generality to address the specifics? What if the law is in some, uh, some other way unclear? What if the law just kind of sort of runs out? Do you think it's descriptively accurate to say that what courts do is figure out what's most likely the best understanding of what the legislature intended? Or do you think that um, the task is a little more refined than that, trying to find where the compromise might have been, where the median votes might have been? What do you think about the idea of deciding what's most likely and going with it? So I think if, if probabilism means that when the answer isn't clear in the text, the judge does her best to figure out what is probably the right answer or what is probably what people would understand this language to mean, then I'm on board. I think that's just describing what everybody hopes. I think the difference between us might be in what you're aiming at. Are you trying to aim at figuring out what the legislature intended to say in this context? I think that end game is a little bit different than saying what would an order, what do I think an ordinary person at the time of the statute's enactment would probably have understood that to mean? I think the latter, what an ordinary person would probably understand it to mean, is, is the view. And, and I think, I mean, I'll just take a, a case that you're probably all familiar with that was a big statutory interpretation case last term was the student loans case in which the relevant language was that the Secretary of Education had the power to waive or modify these provisions, meaning these statutory provisions. It wasn't waive or modify loans. It was waive or modify these statutory um, provisions governing the ability of the secretary to make adjustments in times of emergency. And as we all know, the question was whether the secretary of education um, could um, waive all student loans, essentially. So the question is, how do you interpret that language, waive or modify? On the one hand, you might say, well, waiving or modifying these provisions would include significantly rewriting them to forgive broad swaths of student debt. On the other hand, waive or modify seems to have a narrower interpretation, and when seen, I won't go through all the context of the statutory scheme, when seen in the context of the scheme, I think, and I join Chief Justice Roberts' opinion, saying it's, it means make some adjustment to one provision or another. Because in fact, in that case, the Secretary of Education didn't point to any particular provisions that were being modified or waived. The idea was simply like to substitute or to waive or modify more broadly. Now the dissent, Justice Kagan wrote an excellent dissent. I mean, and she said, waive or modify should be interpreted broadly, like in, in a time, like when the, when the Secretary of Education deems it necessary, Wave or modify should go as far as it can. Um, so I think you know that's that's a situation in which you can see that the terms of the debate, and Justice Kagan would consider herself a text considers herself a textualist, are not we can depart beyond these words, wave or modify, to accomplish what we think Congress would have wanted or what makes sense at this particular moment in time. The argument is about how broadly to interpret those terms in the context of the statute. And so if the goal is to figure out what is probably the best answer, how would one probably understand that phrase, waive or modify statutory provisions in the context of the statute, well then I think that that is the goal. Thank you. We will open up for uh, questions. <laughs>
point is that we use probabilism when we cannot know. So the whole notion of probability is uh, uh, to give one a rule of decision in conditions of uncertainty. And so, for example, if, so if you mention this paper, I go to Justice Scalia's decision, among other things, in Crawford, Crawford versus Washington, where Justice Scalia says, and that's, you know, and any evidence scholar who knows something about how the confrontation clause has evolved would agree with this. He says, look, confrontation clause was not about uh, uh, reliability, was not about improving uh, 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 the accuracy of fact-finding criminal trial, it was about to limit the government's power to enlist people out of court by taking those affidavits as they did in England. And this was the practice that the founding fathers wanted to outlaw. And I say, okay, granted this, there is no certainty at all that the founding fathers, had they known about the practice, not of taking affidavits as they did in England, but how criminal investigation goes on in terms of dynamics. And uh, you know, I happen to see it in quite a few criminal cases, uh, and we have a lot of them, unfortunately. Uh, uh, and, and, and so police officers, they, uh, the way they do documentation doesn't even begin to resemble the practice of affidavit that the founding fathers wanted to outlaw. Yet Justice Scalia says, no, I take it broadly. And I say, well, if you take it broadly, then this is not strictly speaking uh, textualism. This is textualism supplemented with your probabilistic judgment that in all likelihood the founding fathers would have outlawed this uh, uh, practice as well. And I agree. And so that's the difference. So we need to introduce, you need to be, we need to be explicit about probability. Oh, if we are serious, okay, about treating law as a fact. So if you want to be a positivist, okay, if you want to treat law as a fact, it's a factual thing, then you've got to introduce evidence into this game in order to make decisions about facts, because without evidence, without those rules, or without whatever evidentiary practices you accept, you cannot even talk about facts, certainly not in conditions of uncertainty. But if you say that law is not a fact, but there's something else, then you're not a positivist. If you're not a positivist, you cannot be textualist either. That's the thing. Both of you, before you became judges, thought long and hard about this medieval problem um, and were pressed to abandon offers that you thought were of sound solution. Um, in your time judging, um, has your experience as a judge changed any 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 of the way you kind of looked at the, the way you looked at things as a scholar? You don't know, have to say like I've changed my position on this or this or that, but you know, how does your role change the way you think about the legal problems that you used to grapple with when you were writing law review articles? And when I was writing law review articles, I got to say what Amy Coney Barrett thought <laughs> in my own voice, like unhindered by you know having to actually just say, well, that precedent is wrong. And, and I think the big difference in judging is being on a multi-member court where you're not writing. I'm not, I mean, unless I'm writing a concurrence or a dissent, I'm not writing just for me. Um, and so it, let's imagine I'm assigned the majority opinion. It's my responsibility to represent the views of the majority in the conference. So let's imagine you know, there were you know, seven people who voted with the majority. Um, they may not have seen it exactly as I did. And so my task isn't to analyze the problem in the way that I even necessarily think is the cleanest. I wouldn't ever write or join an opinion that I didn't agree with but the path of the reasoning is not necessarily my choice. The breadth of the holding is not necessarily my choice because I want to hold my majority together, right? So I have to, it's a little bit path, defended, path dependent. Now, I, I would say like, you know, Justice Thomas doesn't quite have that view. <laughs> um, so Justice Thomas often is writing separately because it's hard for him to write on behalf of the majority because especially since so Justice Thomas won't rely on precedents that he dissent when he was a dissenter in the past. And so if you accept those precedents as a starting point, then Justice Thomas won't be able to join you know, that part of your opinion. And then it would be hard for him to write an opinion where the majority wanted to rely on those precedents. Um, so I think that I don't have that approach um, to judging. And I also think it's important in some circumstances I mean, let's imagine that you could write an opinion the way that you wanted it, but you would only get a plurality. 
And so you might have four justices signing on to it, one who would only be willing to concur in the judgment, and then the rest in dissent. Well, I think there's some value. I mean, I'm also writing on behalf of the court and the system. There's some value in trying to settle the question so that lower courts have guidance and litigants have guidance and law students don't have to pull their hair out. Um, <laughs> so that is a reason to maybe write it more narrowly or choose a holding that I believe in, that I believe is right, but wouldn't be my preferred approach if I were writing an article for the Notre Dame Law Review. So I think that um, mediating uh, effect of compromise and of having to take account of others' views you know, for the good of the institution, again, I want to stress, not compromise in the sense of compromising what I think is the right answer or compromising what I believe in. I don't mean that kind of compromise, not like vote trading kind of compromise. I just mean compromise my preference for a passive decision or a breadth of decision um, in order to represent um, the views of the majority of the court. So in my case, uh, you know, my academic work you know, focused so very strongly, you know, in retrospect, maybe too strongly on, uh, on economic analysis of law and law and economics. So I even had the privilege of publishing a, a law and economics article in the Notre Dame Law Review, first time for the past 15 years, according to the editors. This is what they wrote me back in 2006 <laughs> when I published this. <laughs> uh, and, and so, uh, as a judge, you know, uh, what I do, uh, I look for solutions to problems. And uh, as an academic, I did the exact opposite. I was looking for <laughs> problems to solutions. <laughs> this, is what, this is what people in law and economics do. <laughs> Justice Perry, can you just, you said you use the term vote trading, and um, frequently you see commentators and um, students sometimes ask this, are they, making bargains about this case, I'll go this way in this case, if you go with me in that case. Um, can you talk about what that would be like uh, as a cultural matter in the court? If, if it I've never seen that happen if people are doing that, like they're doing that like in ways that are completely unseen to mm -hmm. others. I mean, that would be, um, I think there would be conversations and you know, I've had conversations with my clerks or with other justices about this question that I was talking about, like which grounds of decision if you have two alternate holdings, two possibilities, which one makes more sense? Which one would more people be willing to sign on to? Um, should this part of the opinion that's not, you know, that would be dicta, that's not strictly necessary, should that stay in or go out those kinds of compromises? Sure, but to compromise on a result in one case in exchange for a vote in another, that's not something um, that, it would be very, very shocking to the culture. Here's a little hint for law students. It might not seem to be different to say in an opinion, the law requires X citation versus the court has held that the law requires X citation. <laughs> because Justice Thomas would join the latter. <laughs> <laughs> you see that formulation a lot. Just like you also see the formulation after Justice Scalia would never sign any part of an opinion that cited or relied on legislative history. So the common formulation now is, for those who find legislative history helpful, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Yes? I've asked him this question, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be able to answer it better than Professor Gergen, so. <laughs> um, as you were talking about like evidence and, and things and facts we're relying on to make decisions, it's always perplexing when the majority offers facts and evidence that they're using to support their opinion, and then the dissent is equally using facts and evidence, and let's say that all of the, those facts are true. How do you decide, I mean, I don't want to sound cynical and, and assume that you're really deciding which facts to rely on based on what you want to do, but how do you know which facts are the most uh, supportive and, and hold the most weight and are the best ones to use to form your opinion? Well, in my case, you know, I believe that there is such a thing as empirical truth. And so for that reason, I also believe that two factual propositions that are mutually inconsistent, uh, one of them has got to be wrong. And so uh, uh, I try to figure out the probabilities. And in fact, uh, you know, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not even trying to, I, I don't think that I've even entertained 
uh, you know, a, a glimpse of a cynical thought in this regard. Why so? Because, uh, you know, I do a lot of appellate work because our court has a plenary jurisdiction and so we do have some appeals as of right and we do resolve actual measures. And so the worst thing that I can, you know, conceive of as being a judge for me is to convict an innocent person, okay? And so I take very seriously proof beyond a reasonable doubt requirement. In fact, Justice Scalia took it extremely seriously. Uh, this side of it, on the, this side of Justice Scalia's uh, legacy, I don't think it was even adequately discussed in the literature, you know, the way he protected the rights of criminal defendants. Uh, but uh, g going back to probabilities, uh, we've got to be, since courts do it every day, we've got to be able to figure out, since courts, they say we are able to decide the civil case in the preponderance of the evidence. We are able to decide the criminal case by, by acquiring proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So I say I'm also able to decide upon probabilities, which proposition as to what the law demands is more probable than not. And so technically, I conceive of law as a sort of messages communicated by the lawmaker, and then I make a list, and then I ask myself, given the evidence, the entire, the whole, the, uh, the all the relevant evidence, which is the most probable. And this one that is the most probable is what I would say is the law. Same as making a decision on the preponderance of the evidence in a criminal case. In a civil case, sorry. In, or in a criminal, if it's beyond reasonable doubt. But for me, preponderance is enough in, in matters of interpretation. I just wonder why cats keep the records of them. There's a question of whether cats are talking about a thing like sexual allergy to people who don't see a big hole in their cat's hair or something like that. Can you just sort of speak to the question of like um, what would what would make you want to be a judge given what you know is coming in the confirmation process and the decision making process in the future and the fact that you know that there's going to be such an issue with respect to the validity of all these cats. Can you, can you just sort of speak about that? Sure, I think it's public service, honestly. I mean, I think in many ways, um, there are many things that I liked about my life a lot better when I was a law professor, um, and even when I was a judge on the Second Circuit. Um, so I, I do think it's a matter of serving my country. Um, and I knew um, when my husband and I had to decide whether we were open to the Supreme Court nomination that there would be hard things ahead, but there would be for anybody who had been in my position. So, you know, if it weren't me, if I said no, whoever else might have been selected would face the exact same difficulties that I would. So I do think it's a matter of public service. I think um, in terms of what has taken, I mean, one reason, I didn't really have enemies when I was a law professor, and now, you know, People on the right are mad at me, people on the left are mad at me, so I must be doing something right. Um, I think you have to be, you have to develop a thick skin. So you have to be the kind of person that is willing not to be a people pleaser, to have people criticize you. Um, you know, I, I was flipping around news channels in my hotel room before I came over here, and there was some person on Fox News because of an order that came out uh, yesterday about the border, a border dispute saying, has Amy Coney Barrett drinking the Washington DC Kool-Aid? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is a very weird experience. <laughs> um, so I just think you have to have a, a thick skin and willing to have people criticize you and be willing to do what you think is right. And when I say that, I don't mean like right in like a, an abstract sense or what you think would be best, but like be willing to say what you think the law requires in a particular case, irrespective of what's gonna come thereafter. And I think that's an unpleasant thing to do and a hard thing to do, but people do lots of unpleasant and hard things in service of country and of other causes as well. I feel like I haven't looked over here at all. So, one more question, yes. <laughs> 
Well, first of all, in, in terms of panel, we, uh, uh, I must clarify, unlike the United States Supreme Court, normally we sit in panels of three. Then if there is a big enough a legal issue, then the presiding justice may decide to expand the panel and then the chief justice will decide how to expand. Or alternatively, the chief justice will expand the panel right away. And so we do have different panels that are random, actually, except for some cases. So for example, criminal cases and tax cases, they more often than not, they, they go to me and some other justices who do this kind of work. But when it comes to constitutional cases, it's completely random in order to avoid any sort of argument that, you know, that the panel was, uh, you know, manufactured or whatever you want to, to call it. In terms of, we have excellent relationships. So I must say, you know, I was in the legal academia and I did have decent relationships with my colleagues. And so I was sort of hesitating uh, as I was stepping in as a justice, given all these disagreements. And what I found in, 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 in our court was completely the opposite. You have phenomenal relationships uh, among uh, justices. You do disagree, you do so respectfully, and we also have personal friendships, even though, again, we don't have agreements on, on, on many issues. And, and from this perspective, you know, I, I, I'm really, I'm absolutely happy about this job, and I'm genuinely happy about this job, except that it's really, really hard. You know, in Israel, because of the volume <laughs> of cases and because of the, all these tensions, uh, people keep asking me, so what it takes to be a Supreme Court justice? What do, what do they say? Well, you know, you go through this notion, through this nomination. So when the Minister of Justice called me and said, look, I want to nominate you, I was extremely happy. And I went through this process. I really like this process, which is not like the American confirmation. It's kind of, it's very sort of legal, kind of very prof strictly professional. There are committees, subcommittees, you go through the interviews, and then there is a vote based on this in in information. And so, uh, when I uh, when I stepped in, it was you know it was just you know, it was just great in terms of uh, colleagues and, and everything. And so it you know, so to my surprise, and so I'm not surprised by your question, but I was surprised to find out how good it was. And so the only thing, as I said, the only problem is that you know when you come in, they say you know we usually people are appointed in their sixties. Uh, to the Israeli Supreme Court, and then they say, pretend that you're 35, given the volume of work. That's a problem. <laughs> uh, uh, how frequently do you serve as an en banc 15 judge panel? And how frequently is a 15 justice panel uh, this was convened? The one, this was the only time. Right, that right. was the first time in the entire history that the Chief Justice decided that this is going to be en banc because of this uh, constitutional crisis. So, there is a big difference between what happened in the United States in those years, even, even though it was so fiercely debated. I was even surprised when I, you know, read, you know, how people spoke, you know, just by looking, you know, into sheer language, like how people spoke about different positions taken, that taken place in, this, in the debate over Dobbs. In Israel, it was even more, okay? So what was questioned in this case is not just the constitutional issue, but the very nature of law. It was like, okay, now you're going to run the whole gamut of legal theory up to, you know, Hartian rule of recognition. Right. And, and, and so you, you work it out or else. <laughs> and then, the, and, and so I, I totally agree with the, with the Chief Justice's uh, move to say, okay, there is no choice. We've got to see the all 15 of us that do what we can. And then we also had this problem with the retirement, because in Israel there is a mandatory retirement. And when this case uh, uh, came up, two justices, including the chief, didn't have much time. So they had to speed up the process or alternatively to postpone it. And either way, it doesn't look good. Yeah. Well, uh, we're out of time. Before we finish, I want to uh, thank and uh, commend uh, all the uh, court staff, uh, many people who have worked to make this event happen, the University of Tafid. Thank Dean Cole for his uh, work and support for uh, academic uh, freedom and engagement of this sort, which is invaluable, and especially my friend and colleague, Ami Shalom Tor, uh, who is uh, indispensable when I'm here. And finally, I want to thank our two guests. What a treat this has been, and uh, please, please join me in thanking them.